This is Greg from the Super NES Podcast, and when I want to hear about one of Atari's least successful systems, I listen to the Atari 7800 Game by Game Podcast, hosted by Phil, the No Square Gamer, because there's no podcast yet on the Jaguar. Thank you, Greg. And when I want to listen to a podcast about a 16-bit system without blast processing, I listen to the SNES Podcast. On today's episode of the Atari 7800 Game by Game Podcast, we will be talking about CX-7805 Galaga and CX-7806 Joust. And for some reason, Mr. Do Too. Can I go on break now? Hey guys, welcome to episode 5 of the Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast. My name is Phil and I'm your host. It's been a very interesting time since the last podcast for me. Uh, One thing that happened was I set a high score at Atari age. I beat one of the all-time high score club scores. They were doing Double Dragon on the 7800 and at the time the high score was 112,000. 340 by atomic knee drop and that was the all-time high score so i was playing along and i was doing rather well and at first i you know i did i did okay i did pretty good i got in the 70 thousands then later on let's see if i can look this up here then later on atomic knee drop came back and beat his high score with 116,230 so he broke his original record so that was the first time the high score was broken then I followed up and actually beat his high score with 107 I'm sorry 117,160 points and he and and so for a while I actually had the high score and then two days later the day before the end he came back with another high score of 126,000 and 70 points which was a very good high score i don't know if i could uh, get up that high but it was kind of cool that in one kind of high score challenge the all-time high score record was broke three times so i can say for a smidgen i guess i can say i don't know it's kind of like one of those things where you know it's the olympics and you one guy breaks the world record and then in the very next heat the next guy breaks it it's kind of one of those things so i don't know if i technically had it but for a while I beat the highest score posted at Atari age. So that was really cool. And what really helped me, and I know this sounds like a commercial, but I really like this product was the Seagull 78 adapter by Ed Ladd and controllers, because I did that using a Sega Genesis six button controller. One of my favorite controllers, maybe my favorite controller of all time with my 7,800. Of course that lets you use both buttons. And that really helped because if you use the ProLine controller on double dragon, it can really cramp your hands as it can with a lot of games. So that was something cool that happened there. And then later on, well, my whole family came down with a bug. We were sharing it and now a lot of coughing has been going on and I've been getting dry through it. So if my voice sounds a little weird, I apologize. It's just part of getting over the bug. Every once in a while I have to stop recording to cough because it just dries out my throat. But enough about that. Let's go on and go to today's games, Galaga and Joust. Galaga the arcade game was developed by Namco, who brought it to Japan in September of 1981. It was brought by Midway to the U.S. in December of 1981. If you'd like to learn more about Namco and its curious, wonderful history, be sure to check out episode 4 where I talk about it along with Dig Dug. Galaga is a single-screen space shooter and is the sequel to Galaxian, which I'm guessing some gamers are not aware of that Galaga is a sequel. Galaga has a lot of interesting features, especially when you compare it to a game like Space Invaders. For one thing, enemies appear flying on screen in different groups from the off screen, rather than just appearing in formation. There are also flagships, or boss Galagas, that take two hits to kill. They can also capture your ship, which can be regained and combined for a double fire power, if you shoot the flagship while it's attacking you. If you destroy the flagship that has your captured ship, when it is not attacking, your captured ship will fly away and appear with a new flagship on the next stage. You can also destroy your captured ship, so you always want to be careful when shooting. 
When flagships try to capture your ship with a tractor beam, your ship will start spinning. While briefly spinning, you can continue to shoot in both the arcade and NES versions, but not on the 7800. There's also bonus levels scattered throughout the game. The game keeps track of the percentage of your shots that actually hit and offers you a rapid fire option which was unusual for that time, meaning that you can hold the button down and it will continuously shoot. Once you pass level 255 to the infamous Namco 256, different things may happen depending on the game and its settings. The game might loop back starting at stage 0 or might even lock up needing to be reset. Galaga in the arcade was followed by 1984's Gap Plus or also known as Galaga 3, and I don't know why you call it Galaga 3 since it's the sequel to Galaga, so wouldn't it be Galaga 2, or you could call it Galaxian 3, but oh well, whatever. In 1987, uh, another release came out called Galaga 88, and in 1990 came out Galaxian 3, which is a big environmental unit that I think six players can actually enter and play in. Galaga also appeared on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The arcade version can be found in several versions of Namco Museum on many platforms. Like Dig Dug before, there was a Galaga arrangement that was part of several of the Namco Museums. There was a remake called Galaga Destination Earth that was released on the PlayStation 1 and Game Boy Color. There was also a Galaga remix that was part of the Wii's version called Namco Museum Remix. Galaga Legions and Legions DX appeared on Xbox Live and the PlayStation Network in recent history, and Pac-Man and Galaga Dimensions was released on the 3DS as well, and I believe that includes a version of the Legions game. Uh, Not entirely sure I haven't played either of those. Galaga appeared in the movie The Avengers and War Games, and on the TV show Lost, there was a submarine named after Galaga, and I believe it's also going to be appearing in the upcoming movie Pixels. In 2009, Hallmark released an ornament based on the Galaga arcade game. It is really something to look at. The previous year, they released one based on Pac-Man. This was the next in the series. They may have made more, but I'm guessing this one wasn't successful. What both of these are, are they're basically miniature arcade cabinets. Uh, You can't actually play the game on it. It has like a little graphic on the screen. It doesn't animate or anything. But there is a button to push to make some sounds and music. They're both very cool. I have the Galaga one. It's been a while since I had it out. I didn't get it out last Christmas. The previous Christmas I had it out and my kids scratched up one of the sides and made me a little bit upset. So I think that's one of the reasons I kept it in this year. But I'll need to get it out soon. But it is very cool. It's perfect size for a G.I. Joe or Star Wars figure. I'm talking like the three and uh, three quarter inch ones, not the big massive ones. So that might give you an idea how big it is. I have a couple cheats for the arcade version for those of you who are interested. Here's one that supposedly is uh, well known, but I didn't know about it until I did some research that causes the enemies to stop firing. That works on most of the machines, but not all of them. There's been several releases of the Galaga machine, so I guess it just depends. On the first stage, kill everything but two bees in the bottom left corner. Then wait, dodging the bee shots until no bees no longer drop any shots towards you. After the bees stop firing, Let it pass five more trips or so and then kill them. For the rest of the game, the enemies will not drop shots. It will take approximately 15 minutes for the bees to quit shooting at you. So this trick requires a lot of patience, especially if someone's behind you waiting to play the arcade game, I guess. Uh, Some people have also reported that this trick will also work with two bees on the right side of the screen. Note that in a two-player game, only one person has to do this for the cheat, has to do the cheat for both players to benefit. So interesting there. Here's another trick. The player 1 score counter in Galaga is 6 digits, but the player 2 counter is 7 digits. Therefore, most good players will start a 2-player game and play exclusively on the player 2 side, so their score will not roll over at 999,990. Challenging stages are easier if the high score numbers are used to refine your aim, so very interesting there as well. And finally, here's an interesting bug that exists in uh, Galaga and the Miss uh, Miss Pac-Man Galaga, Namco Galaga, some Midway Galagas, and various other Galagas that allow a player to play during the Galaga demo screen and even reset the game during the demo. The demos are the same for both Galaga and the Miss Pac-Man slash Galaga Class 81 machine, and the bug works the same way, but the results is a little different between the two. During the Galaga demo, the Galaga characters come down and tries a tractor beam up the player's ship. As soon as that tractor beam starts, the player can take control of the ship in the demo. The player has two choices here, and this will affect how the game handles this bug. 
If the player allows himself to be captured, the demo will continue as normal, and he has the option of controlling the player ship or not. The player can choose whether to save the captured ship, try and complete the level, and etc. The demo mode will complete after 30 seconds and the high score screen will appear. If the player takes control of the ship and destroys the Galaga with the, tra with the tractor beam, he will be able to continue playing until the normal demo would have completed. At this point, the game will do one of two things depending on whether the person is playing the original Galaga or the Miss Pac-Man Galaga combo. In the regular Galaga, some of the characters on screen will freeze while others still moving, doing what they are supposed to be doing. This will last 15 to 20 seconds, then the game will go to the high score screen. On the Miss Pac-Man Galaga combo, this game will make a loud buzz sound. A blank, uh, it'll blank the screen and then show a diagnostic screen with the version number of the games, a RAM and ROM test, and etc. This screen will stay on for approximately 10 seconds before returning to the high score screen. If someone needs to know the version of the software on their board set, this can be a handy way of finding out without opening the cabinet. So I never knew you could take control of the demo. There's been many times when I was in an arcade and I messed around with games, especially during the demo, but nothing ever happened. So, boy, this would have just blown my socks off if this actually happened to me. I did play the arcade game a couple times. And I think it's one of the first times I saw an arcade Easter egg is the ship getting cap captured. I think that is a really cool feature. Galaga was probably released as part of the 1984 test launch in Southern California. But my guess is widespread it was released in 1986. And according to AtariProtos.com, it was programmed by Dave Crawl for GCC. Now, in my opinion, the box art on the front is, is some of the best box art on the 7800 and just some great box art in general. It has a very nice Galaga logo on top, but there's a lot of area used for the actual illustration. This is opposed to some other games like Dig Dug where they take a portion of the box just for the logo and they put like a single color behind it. This one actually, it really pops out. You have what appears to be, I guess it's one of the B uh, Galaga fighters flying at you with some of the swarm behind them. You can see other fighters in the background. There is like a planet or a moon that you can see in the background as well. And it looks like the sun rising, which is a very cool effect because you don't usually see that on these space artwork or video game boxes. And of course you have some stars and like some purple clouds to give it a little bit more flavor. The uh, Galaga itself is a silver metallic kind of flying bee, as you will with uh, some transparent wings that you can kind of see through. And one of the coolest features is that you can actually see it's in its two eyes, uh, fighter pilots piloting it. So there's like a fighter in each one. They kind of looked almost insect warrior-ish as well. And uh, yeah, just lots of personality and really cool, especially if you compare it to what the Nintendo had for theirs. Theirs featured a Galaga that looked more like a 1990s G.I. Joe toy than it did uh, something menacing, okay? But this actually this actually looks really well done. And if you, if you haven't seen it, especially the color version, I don't have the box, I just had the cartridge, so that's in black and white, as it was a lot of these early releases. But if you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. It's some really great artwork. And I actually found out the artist this time. It was done, done by a guy named Mark Erickson, who did some other gaming art, including stuff for like the Lynx and, and uh, a Game Pro cover and... One of the uh, baseball games, I want to say it's like, uh, it was for the Genesis. It's one of these electronic arts ones, but I think it was, it was like Baseball Super 2020 or something like that. It was a futuristic one. But uh, you can check out more of his artwork on his site, which is really cool. Now, a lot of the artwork will just be the artwork. So like the Galaga artwork is on there, but it doesn't say Galaga. It takes the logo off so you can just see his artwork. But if you want to go to his site, it's his name, which is spelled Mark, which is M-A-R-C, and Erickson, E R I cksen.com so that's m a r c e r i c k s e n.com and I'll try and remember and put that on my Facebook page as well on the back of the box you have another picture of a couple of the uh, Galaga ships and it says blast them there is a single screen with actually quite a bit of action i remember some of the other games like asteroids didn't show a lot on the screen but this one actually shows a fair amount of uh, galagas and it says, they're colorful, they're exquisite, they're beautiful, and they're out to get you. Blast dive bombing warriors in this timeless arcade classic, or get blasted. And that's basically it. It's very little description. It says, 32 waves of winged warriors for one or two players, three skill levels for use with the Atari 7800 series systems, and for use with the Atari 7800 controllers. The manual is just a simple folded four-page manual in your standard black, white, and a little bit of red uh, coloring. 
On the front cover is a, another black and white version of the box art, which still looks cool, but I definitely prefer the color. And inside it says the following. You're under attack. The Galligans are reclaiming planets they lost during a centuries-old interstellar war, and now they want yours. And you're ready to fight to the bitter end to protect it. So they lost planets during the war, and they want yours. Did you take their planet? Are they just out to get what used to belong to them? I'm a little confused there. So you joined the intergalactic warrior fleet. Without training, you're assigned to your first combat mission. And on the job is the only way to learn. Shaking in your boots, you accept the assignment and board your intergalactic command ship. So it almost sounds like you took over their planet. They're out to get you. So what does the army do? It takes rookies and throws them in gigantic spaceships to defend the planet. This, this is not a good setup at all the manual goes on to tell you that you can select a one or two player game two players are alternating this time there is no uh, simultaneous play and that there's three difficulty levels novice advance and expert it says that you press the controller button to fire intergalactic missiles hold them down to rapid fire and of course you use your joystick to go left and right under playing the game it says defending the planet you start the game with four command ships one at the line of battle and the others reserve at the bottom of your screen Slide your command ship right and left to dodge the, Gal the Galligan fire. At the same time, fire intergalactic missiles to protect your ship. I'm glad you got intergalactic missiles because I'm guessing that outer galactic missiles would not work in this case. You lose a ship when it is hit by a Galligan missile or collides with the enemy. Galligans attack in a series of waves, each fiercer than the one before. Waves are identified with the number at the lower right of the screen. The number of ships you have in reserve is shown to the lower left. Galligan flagships never fly, fly alone. They are always flanked by protective escorts in colorful uniforms. Escort rank is easy to identify. Drones the lowest rank wear blue, hornets are outfitted in red, and flagship commanders the highest rank wear yellow. I didn't realize that had anything to do with them, the rank. Interesting. The Galligan invasion starts off with a bang. An entire fleet of invaders begin flying in formation and instantly plunges towards you, bombarding your ship and then rushing back to the lineup. That is, if you don't shoot them first. The Galligans attack faster and faster with each wave. They swoop downward, firing laser cannons. They charge in single file or blitz in groups. The enemy's special radar lets them dodge your intergalactic missiles. They use tricks to divert your attention. Their ability to pull off unexpected maneuvers force you to quickly learn caution, cunning, and skill. You thwart the initial attack, but the battle isn't over. The Galligans will be back stronger than ever, and you'll be waiting... The longer you survive, the more surprises you're in for. To win, use your accurate aim and quick reflexes. Plan your strategy. Think ahead. A foolish move could cost you the battle and the planet. For strategy, it says try a few games at the novice level first while you're learning to play Galaga. This will help you develop skill and strategy. When Galligan flagships are hit the first time they turn blue, they hit a second time they explode. Galligan flagships deploy blue macro beans that can capture your command ship. To rescue the hostage, hit the flagship only while it's attacking or you will destroy your own ship as well. Once you regain your ship, you will have two ships moving and firing in sync to attack with. When the Galligan flagship is destroyed in flight, the rest of the fleet stops firing for a few seconds of mourning. Wow, interesting. Move quickly to blast the escorts before they can retaliate. I don't know if I knew that. I don't know if I noticed that they stopped for a second. Very, <laughs> very cute. They're mourning. By the way, I think the game is wrong because if you shoot the flagship and it's not attacking you, like I said with the arcade version, um, your ship will just go to the next screen. Unless it's a bonus level, then that might ruin it up. So you can still gain your ship back even if you shoot it when it's just up at the top. After two waves of attack, then after every third wave, you face a challenging stage. I th actually, I think that's supposed to be a challenge stage. Okay. Five groups of eight ships fly in various attack patterns. Shoot as many ships as you can before the ship leaves. Hit all 40 for 10,000 bonus points. Always have a strategical escape plan to avoid patterns of enemy missile attacks. Scan the screen and think fast to outsmart the, Gallag the Galligan fleet. For scoring, it says you score points when you destroy Galligans. The score appears at the top of the screen. Player 1's score is on the left. Player 2's is on the right. It's all your command ships. If all your command ships are destroyed, the game is over. At the end of the game, the player with the most points wins. Thanks for pointing that out. Points are valued listed below. For flagships, the first hit, you don't get any points, but the second one, you get 150. When hornets are lined up, you get 80 points each. When they're attacking, you get 160. When drones are lined up, you get 50. And when they're attacking, you get 100. 
Destroying the flagship can earn you bonus points. When they're with two escorts, you will earn 1,600 points with one, 800, and when they're with none, 400. And for the challenging stages to earn bonus points, uh, if you destroy a group of eight ships, you can get from 1,000 to 3,000 points. You destroy all 40, you get 10,000. And bonus for destroying less than 40 ships, you get 100 points per ship. And that is the manual for Galaga. Graphically speaking, I think the game is a step down from the arcade. And probably you would be fair to say a step down from even the NES version. But I still think it looks pretty good. The tractor beam does look kind of weird when it goes down. It doesn't look uh, like any other version. But you could definitely tell what everything is. And for the most part, I thought it looked pretty good on this system. Musically speaking, again, for the most part, it's a step down, but I did like some of the music, especially in between when they had that kind of that space kind of sound going on, that space music theme with a little bit of the echo. I thought that sounded really good. But other than that, you're just talking your standard, you know, blasting kind of uh, sounds for the most part, but I, I think it did a fair job. Rarity wise, this is a common game. Both Atari Age and Digital Press give both, uh, they both give it a one. On eBay, when I was averaging prices, and I include shipping when I average prices, loose copies typically went for about $8. Complete copies went for about $11 to $12. And new copies, still sealed, would be about $15. And of course, those prices can range. On Atari Age, as far as their external reviews go, they had six different scores for an average of 82%. The high was 95% and the low was 70 As far as the high score challenge over at Atari Age goes... At the advanced level, the high score was made by Uyama Family for 610,000 points. And the expert was also done by Uyama Family for 491,150 points, which is probably a lot more than what I got. Did I have Galaga as a kid? Yes, I did. I don't think I had it right away. I think it was one of those early releases I got later on. But I definitely enjoyed this one. I especially like having my ship. Well, sometimes I liked having my ship captured, but there was other times where I was like, oh, why don't I just save my ship and just try and go at one at a time? And uh, one of the things I definitely like about this version is it lets you pick your difficulty. I'm not really good at arcade games on the arcade difficulty. I'm not one of these people who wants to memorize patterns in Pac-Man or uh, really memorize every little nuance of the game so I can get high scores. I just want to have a good time when I play it. So I actually like the fact that in this version, you can select your difficulty. Whereas like the Nintendo version and the arcade version, you you cannot. I did a review on my No Swear Gamer show of a Miss Pac-Man plug and play. And Galaga was on there, which was, I mean, basically arcade perfect for the most part. But it was just so hard. I could only get through a couple waves and then my game was over. So I was like... It just wasn't fun. You couldn't continue on the wave you left off at. And I just didn't have the time to dedicate, you know, especially now that I'm getting up there in the years and have a family and whatnot. I just don't have the time to, to kind of Billy Mitchell it, if you will. So I, I really dig the fact that the 7800 version lets you select your difficulty. I think the Nintendo version resembles the arcade version better. So if you're looking for a better arcade version port other than like the actual port on the Namco Museum, the Nintendo version would be the way to go. But if you're like me and like being able to change with the difficulty, then the Atari 7800 is a really good option. I really enjoyed it, especially using my Ed Ladin joystick. I had a lot of fun uh, playing it. I, I remember playing the novice level up to like the 20s and maybe even 30s. Not so good on the uh, advanced level, but the novice level, I just had a good time just playing it. If I just wanted to play some Galaga and relax, that was the way for me to go. So definitely a, a good choice on the system, in my opinion. So that is Galaga. Let's move on to our next game, Joust. Joust is a single screen arcade game from Williams Electronics in 1982. You are a knight who flies an ostrich. Your goal is to defeat the evil buzzard flying knights by successfully jousting them by hitting them higher than they hit you when you make contact. 
doing so turns them into an egg that you can take out by contact. However, if you take too long, the egg will turn into another enemy. Harry Williams founded Williams Manufacturing in Chicago, Illinois in 1943. It focused on mechanical amusements, including pinball games that were made by recycling and altering older pinball machines due to material shortages during World War II. Initially, Williams focused mainly on pinball machines where he invented the tilt mechanisms and introduced the modern inward-facing flippers and the add-a-ball feature. In 1958, Williams Manufacturing officially became Williams Electronic Manufacturing Company, and in 1964, they were acquired by the Seaberg Corporation, who made jukeboxes. Some popular pinball titles during this time included Apollo, Space Mission, and the Beatles-themed Beat Time. That one's for you, Ferg. When Pong became successful, Williams decided to enter the arcade video game market as well. Their first game was 1973's Paddleball, which was just a Pong clone. In 1974, Williams Electronics was formally formed. Its first major hit was 1980's Defender, which was followed by 1982's Joust and Robotron 2084. At the same time, they kept on having some pinball hits, including 1984's Space Shuttle, 1986's Pinbot, and 1988's Cyclone. In 1985, they had a new name, Williams Electronic Games, and in 1987, they became a publicly traded company called WMS Industries Inc. In 1988, they acquired Bally Midway. You can learn more about Bally. I think it's episode three when I talked about uh, Bally Sente and Sente with Hattrick. Uh, during this time, the Williams and the Bally names were used for their pinball games and the Midway name was used for their video games. And this is why if you buy some of the Midway compilations, you will find a bunch of Williams games on them. In the 1990s, they started to make video lottery terminals and slot machines. In 1991 came the Adams Family, their most successful pinball table, and I believe the most successful pinball table of all time, selling over 20,000 units. In 1993, they followed it by the Twilight Zone, which sold about 15,000 units. And that table is known for having just a bunch of intricate pieces in it. It's very cool to play from what I understand, but very very hard to maintain. But at that time, pinball popularity was starting to fade and they decided to get out of the pinball business. In 1996, they transferred all their video game uh, properties and consolidated it into Midway Games. And in 1998, Midway became a public company on its own. And Williams, from then on, focused, focused exclusively on slot machines, especially video ones, usually with themes of popular movies or TV shows. So you might go into a casino and you might see a Men in Black machine or a Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and it might be made by Williams. They're currently owned by Scientific Games, who has owned them since 2013. So they still have a website, but yeah, now it's all about slot machines. It's just weird that the guys who once made video games are now making uh, machines, uh, I guess, well, still machines made to pull money out of your pocket, except this time they're pulling a whole lot more money out of your pocket the development of the Joust arcade game was headed by John Newcomer. He was previously a toy designer, and when he came in, he wanted to do two games, Joust and War of the Worlds, but his idea for a War of the Worlds game was not uh, feasible, so they went in the direction of Joust. Now, when he wanted to do Joust, he wanted to do something that was different. He didn't want to do another space game, which is kind of ironic because I always thought this game took place in space due to the black background, but I guess that's not the case. And he used the limited Defender hardware to develop it on. Something interesting about these uh, games is that they would use a pack of three AA batteries to save the game high scores when the game was unplugged. So I guess that's an early form of battery saves. As far as the enemies in uh, Joust go, they all have like their certain kind of intricacies, just like the Ghost in Pac-Man. For instance, the Knights get prog progressively more aggressive. Uh, the Bounders fly around randomly. The Hunters will seek you out to make any contact they can. Then the Shadow the shadow Lords will stick to the top screen and fly quickly. The Pterodactyl will also attack idle players and was designed to be difficult to defeat. However, there are two bugs in the arcade game. The first one allows you to force your character through uh, small gaps in the ledges. And they left this in for two reasons. One, because of time constraints, but another reason they, they cited was because it made for an interesting tactic when playing the game. 
Also, due to a last-second change in the pterodactyl sprite in the arcade game, there was a bug where, under certain conditions, the players could basically stand on a ledge, racking up just monstrous amounts of points, taking out pterodactyl after pterodactyl. Uh, Williams actually shipped out a new ROM to fix this. Joust was followed in 1983 by its own pinball game, which is a very interesting pinball table. It's perfectly flat. I kind of call it a cocktail pinball table because there's nothing rising up, no high score artwork rising up. And it's done that way so that two players can play at either side of the table and basically take one another on. It's very cool to look at. I posted a video of it on Facebook and it turns out several of you have seen this at various trade shows. Uh, they only made actually less than 500 of these machines, so they are quite rare. In 1986, there was Joust 2 that came to the arcades, a traditional video game. It wasn't nearly as popular as the original Joust. Ports of the Joust also appeared on the 2600 and 5200 and the Lynx, as well as the NES. And it's also a part of many, many collections, both under the Williams name or the Midway name, such as Arcade Treasures, if you know that. And ironically, I actually owned one of these collections. I think it was under the Williams name. It was made for the TigerGame.com handheld system, a little portable system that had several features ahead of the time, but was kind of poorly made at the same time. But on this collection, I remember Joust being the best game. It was just a little black and white uh, screen and it got blurry very easily, but it was still fun to play. There was also a 3D version in development for the Jaguar CD that was called Dactile Joust, but of course that never came to fruition due to the short life of the Jag CD. Also, the NES has a little bit of a Joust clone itself called Balloon Fight. If you ever heard of that game, it borrows heavily from Joust and is also a lot of fun. At least that's what I think. There were also plans for a movie to be made a couple times. Right now, Warner, Brunner, Warner Brothers owns Midway. And there's a possibility they might look into making a Joust movie in the future. Joust for the 7800 uh, probably came out both in the 1984 launch. I saw pictures of the 1984 cart that I posted on my Facebook page and was probably part of the 1986 uh, full launch as well. It was designed by Pete Gaston and I found that out uh, by an Easter egg that I will share in a little bit later. The box for Joust has some just incredible artwork on it. Uh, kind of like some of the other games like Dig Dug, the, you have the big name of the arcade game Joust at the top and a little bit of a blue kind of square rectangle in the background. So the actual artwork itself doesn't take all of the space, but it does do a good job using it. On it, you have yourself on your ostrich heading straight at you with your lance actually coming through almost 3D-ish right at you. And one of the feet of the ostriches is breaking through the box uh, square, if you will. In the background, you can see some platforms, a couple eggs, which look perfectly round in this case, and some buzzer, buzzard riders in the back. All the buzzard riders are riding on green birds and are various colors. You got a red, white, and blue version of each. So the American buzzard riding team is after you. I think this, this, this artwork is awfully great. And I mean, awful as in bad. It is both terrible and great at the same time. Uh, you look kind of interesting. You're wearing this gold armor. You have these wings on your helmet and you have the visor from Cyclops of the X-Men on and no expression on your face. You kind of look like Robocop. You're just expressionless and your feet. Um, well, both of your feet are in the stirrups and they're like sticking straight out. Like you're pumping your legs straight ahead if you're going on the swing. So kind of interesting there. It looks like you really don't know what you're doing riding on your ostrich here. Uh, it, it's just kind of bizarre to look at just the way, cause usually when people like ride a horse or something, they kind of bend their knees or put them by the sides, but nope, this case, your, your toes are almost in front of you. Now, what really makes this great is the ostrich himself or herself. I really can't tell the difference here. He is a blue ostrich with some white feathers coming straight at you and just screaming. And what really makes the screaming great is he has teeth on the top row of his beak, except there are none in the middle. It's like he's missing his two front teeth, but he looks intense. And looking at this picture, it almost looks like the ostrich is in more control than you are, that you're just hanging out for the ride and the ostrich is the one who's truly going to battle. The back of the box is very, very basic. There's a lot of white space. There's only a single screenshot and really it doesn't show a lot of action. There's you and uh, three buzzard riders flying around in a couple eggs, but it, you're just standing there and I think they could have chose a better screenshot. 
you have uh, the illustration of the three buzzard riders from uh, the front, the American buzzing rider team uh, on the back here as well. And it says touche in big black font. And for the description, it says saddle up your ostrich, gather your wits and hold on tight. Many well-meaning knights have been knocked off their ostriches. So watch out for the buzzard riders. They'll think you're bait. Five positively perilous waves for one or two players, four skill levels for use with the Atari 7800 series systems and for use with the 7800 controllers. So yeah, it's a very limited background. And actually I saw some of the 1984 box, which I also posted on my Facebook page and I really dug it. They went to more detail on the back and they even called it your ostrich steed. I think ostrich steed should be a, a word that is used more often in today's vernacular. And as with a lot of the early releases, the manual is just a four page foldable manual with your black, white, and red ink. And it says this, there are alien worlds and then there are alien worlds. How clever. Who could have predicted that you'd ever find yourself this far from home astride an alien ostrich under attack by bird-born Avengers? It tells you you can select a one or two player game where the knights can battle the opponents together or battle each other. It tells you to move the controller handle to left or right to choose your difficulty level, beginner, intermediate, advanced, or expert. You use your control handle to move your bird left and right. The longer you hold, the handle to the side, the faster the bird moves. Press the controller button repeatedly to make him fly. Playing the game, as a bird-born knight, you ride an ostrich into combat. Beginning the game with 5 lives, for every 20,000 points you score, you earn an extra life. Your opponents are the buzzard riders. There are three types, each more fearsome than the one before. The bounder, the least fearsome, wears red. The hunter wears gray. And the shadow lord, the most fearsome, wears blue. The buzzard riders attack in waves. Both you and the buzzard riders materialize for the first time in the gray space on top of the ledges. Until a bird and rider fully materialize, they are protected from attack. Once moving, they become fair game for a joust, in which one mounted knight attacks another. The winner of the joust is a rider whose mount is the highest at the moment of contact. If the mounts are at the same level, the joust is a draw. If you lose a joust, you lose a life and you'll materialize again if you have lives remaining in the gray space. If your opponent loses, he suddenly riderless, his suddenly riderless mount lays an egg in frustration. Wow, that's, that's an interesting. I'm frustrated, so I'm going to lay an egg. The egg then sails through the space until it comes to rest on a ledge or falls into the lava and is destroyed. If it's on a ledge, pick it up quickly or it will hatch another opponent at the intermediate level and even more menacing opponents at the advanced and expert levels. So you're picking it up. I thought you were just crushing it i really don't think you're picking up where would you put them and what would keep them from hatching if you picked them up anyways sometimes a fast moving pterodactyl tries to eat you to save yourself you must be quick and precise lancing the opponent in the mouth which i don't think i even tried to do i just avoided him beneath the lowest ledge lives the troll of the lava pits after the second wave of attacking buzzard riders, the troll's fire burns away the bridges that kept the jousters safe from them. Any jouster who falls into the lava pit dies. If you fly too near the pits, the troll's hand reaches out and draws you toward the deadly lava, except at the beginner level. If the troll captures you, you may be able to escape by flying away fast and breaking his grip, which when I was playing, I noticed the computer opponents several times got in his grip but always broke away. When you're vanquished all your opponents and picked up all the eggs in the wave, a new wave begins and a new menace comes with it. The waves are survival wave. If you make it through this wave without losing a life, you earn 30,000 or 3,000 extra points. The egg wave, all your opponents start as eggs, eat them quick eggs quickly before they hatch. Okay, so now you're eating the eggs. So at one point you're collecting them and now you're eating them. And who's eating them, you or the ostrich? Because that's kind of, you know, crazy. That's some that's some weird drive through there. Then the Terry wave. The wave starts with the marauding pterodactyl on the screen. The team wave for two players. If neither player unseats the other, you both earn 3,000 points. And in the gladiator wave, the first player to unseat the other in a two-player game earns 3,000 points. If you unseat a buzzard rider, you get 500 points for the bounder, 750 for the hunter, and 1,500 for the shadow lord. Picking up an eggs, you get 250 points for the first one per round, 500 for the second, 750 for the third, and the fourth or more you get 1,000 points each. And if you grab them in mid-air, you get an extra 500 bonus points. But if you unseat the second player in a standard game, you get 2,000 points for that. If you destroy the pterodactyl, you get 1,000 points. And if you lose a life, because everybody wins, you get 50 points. And of course, you get a life for every 20,000 points you score. So that, in a nutshell, is the manual 
for joust. The cartridge is also a black and white uh, cartridge as well as was often the case with these early release games. I think there's like eight or ten of them that are all black and white. Graphically speaking, it is a very simple game. You got the black background. It is a single screen. There's no stars in the background. Uh, the ledges are just simple ledges. Your characters look pretty well. I mean, it looks like a decent version of Joust, to be honest with you. There's, I don't think the original Joust was impressive to look at anyways, but it does, it does a good job, and I like the little bit of an animation when the platforms occasionally explode in between levels when they take one of them out of it. I, the troll hand does kind of look just like a, at least to me, like a brown blob coming out of the lava. At first, I didn't know what it was, and then I kind of remembered because it's been a while since I played. As far as the sound goes, I think it does a pretty good job replicating the arcade sounds. It's probably not arcade perfect, but I really like the harshness to it, if that makes sense. It kind of has this edge to it that the Nintendo version doesn't. <laughs> I haven't played the Nintendo version, but I did look at some video of it, and I definitely prefer the sounds in the Atari 7800 version. Uh, I, I really can't say about how the other one plays, but the Atari version plays well, and I think the sound's a big part, because graphically, this is not, again, it's not that impressive of a game, you know, so unless you're talking like the Atari 2600, this is definitely a step up from that. But when you get to like the NES and the 7800 when it comes to this game, I think they're both kind of the same because there's really not a lot you do with Joust. Rarity wise, Atari Age gives it a 1 and Digital Press gives it a 1, making this a very common game for the system. On eBay, the loose prices were, well, about 6 bucks a piece. Complete copies were going for 11 to 12 and new copies for $15. On Atari Age, there was 5 external reviews for a 90% average, which is might be one of the highest averages I've seen. The high was 95, the low was 80. At the Atari Age High Score Club, at the intermediate level, the high score uh, all-time record is 225,300 points by Atomic Knee Drop. And for the advance, it was 138,550 by Lidwario. And at the expert level, the high score was 126,800 points by Skosh. This is a game I had a, as a kid. I don't know if I ever saw the arcade game, to be honest with you. I have played it uh, on the Midway Arcade Treasures Collection, but I don't know if I ever saw the arcade in person. But I did have this a, as a kid, and I did enjoy it, even though it is a very simple game as far as, you know, the graphics are concerned. But, you know, it's all about momentum, I think, this game is, because it's very, very easy to you know, skid out when you're trying to run and stop and turn and flying. It's all about figuring out the momentum, and that really gives this this game a unique flavor. Unlike just about any other game I can think of outside of the uh, Balloon series on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Joust was the only game to appear in Atarian Magazine. Atarian Magazine only had three issues, and sadly, neither one of these games, Galaga or Joust, appeared in the top tens, which is just mind-baffling. It's kind of sad that the Atari magazine didn't really touch too much on some of the earlier games. They just focused on what was available at the time. Anyways, there is a tip and trick for Joust from Aaron in Simi Valley, California, and he says this. At the right two ledges on the 7800, you can go through the crack by taking a running start on the middle ledge, then one small jump, quick press and release of the button, and bounce on the left ledge until you reach the other side. You do that wraparound screen. That's kind of the same thing I was talking about, That they, the bug that was in the arcade. So it's kind of cool that they kept the bug in. I don't know if they did that on purpose or not, but it's there, so there it is. Joust also has an Easter egg. Now, I posted a video of this on my No Swear Gamer YouTube channel and also on the Facebook page. And here it is for those of you listening at home. Here's how to get the hidden credits in Joust. First, of course, you got to turn on your system and you press the select key. Press joystick one down 53 times, then joystick one left 41 times, and then you just wait and the hidden credits will scroll by. So again, you turn on the system, you press select, and then you press joystick one Using joystick one, you press down 53 times and left 41 times, all on the same joystick. So you add that together, and that is 94 joystick movements, which is the most I've ever heard for any trick. Then these credits will scroll uh, scroll by, and then when you start the game, there's a little bit of gibberish that is on the bottom uh, of the rock 
on the screen. So you can check a video of that on my No Swear Gamer page and also on my Facebook page as well. If you want to find me on Facebook, just go to Facebook and search for Atari 7800 Game by Game Podcast. You should find me pretty easily. I think it's also facebook.com slash 7800 Game by Game Podcast. I don't think there's an Atari on there. So that is Joust. Let's go on and save the day with listener feedback. Now it's time for listener feedback. This is the part of the show where the listeners come to the rescue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First up is from Atari Age member Zeptari1, and he says, I have a short food fight story. The short version is this. I was at a mom and pop video game store. When out of the corner of my eyes, I saw a food fight cartridge. This was exciting for two reasons. One, I had played the game. I haven't played the game in about 25 years. And two, I never knew there was a home port. So I grabbed the game in a heartbeat. Flash forward a month. I am hopelessly addicted to all things 7800. I have a council in about a dozen games, even a homebrew of another game I've always wanted, Super Pac-Man. Funny how one random find can turn someone onto a council they have just never thought or cared about. I've played my 7800 more in the past month of Fe- in, in the past month of February than my Xbox One. So there you go. Uh, take that Xbox One. That's what you get for naming your council that. Have I ever told you I really hate the name Xbox One? So thank you, Zeptari. I totally appreciate that. I also got a food fight related email from RJ over at Atari Age and it says this, love the show and all you do as usual, but I think I caught a small discrepancy. Near the end of the latest show during Ferg's letter, it was implied the arcade food fight does not let you select difficulty starting levels, but it does. It displays a horizontal line of varied flavored ice cream cones representing different starting levels that you can select at will. This is similar to the level select on the Arcade Tempest and likely other Atari coin ops. And he's totally correct there. They do let you kind of select levels. In that case, it's the ice cream cones. I don't think, now I haven't played the Arcade Machine. I don't think it lets you take over at the last level. Like once you end your game, you might, I don't know if you can continue or not. I'm guessing maybe you can continue, but in the 7800 version, you can actually end your game, go back to the level select screen. It lets you select all the way up to the top. So uh, not sure about that. If anyone knows, you can let me know. He continues, I was also surprised you haven't seen the arcade food fight. Here in Minnesota, I've seen it (laughs) B-I-T-D. I I guess I'll let that go if you know what that stands for. Uh, In two arcades and more recently in at least two private collections. Maybe a regional thing. Interesting. I was also lucky enough to play it at a gas station within walking distance of my house when I was younger, but there's no way a parent would let their kid walk as far nowadays. You're absolutely right. I remember being able to walk everywhere as a kid, but nowadays my kids can't go uh, just uh, just a couple houses down and that's about it, you know. Uh, the last day of 7th or 8th grade after the half day ended, do schools do that anymore? A buddy and I went straight down to the gas station and spent afternoons and lots of money on Food Fight. Many games came and went from that location. Miss Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Time Pilot, and Kroll, to name a few, few, but that's another story. I didn't realize Kroll had an arcade game. Keep on, keep, I'm sorry, keep keeping on and doing what you do, RJ from Atari Age, and I totally appreciate that. And yes, um, well, in my school system, we, where I'm at now, uh, they don't do, they didn't do half days, but they started something called early release days, which is like a half day where the kids get out two hours early. They can still eat lunch. And maybe that's because there's a lot of free and reduced kids lunch in my County. So they want to make sure they get the lunch, but yeah, they do that uh, like 10 times a year. No, I don't know. Maybe it's just five times a year, but and uh, I remember B I T D when I used to get half days all the time and how much I enjoyed them. And I remember a seven 11, by me and I remember they had Golden Axe by Sega. That's the only game I remember because I was really young. Uh, but that, that's the closest thing I had to a gas station arcade. I, I, miss, I miss bumping into arcade machines everywhere. Laundromats, pizza parlors, uh, 7-Elevens, convenience stores. They used to be all over the place. Every once in a while you still stumble upon one. Ed from edladen.com also emailed me about Dig Dug. He said the show was great. Lots of fun facts and info along the way. Thanks. 
In all my years playing Dig Dug in the arcade and emulation lately on the 7800, I never knew there was a scoring difference in the layers of the soil or that dropping two rocks causes the bonus uh, to appear. I didn't know that either until I researched that. That changes everything. Definitely going to be luring a lot more bad guys to the bottom. Boy, that, that just makes Dig Dug sound more devious. I have one tidbit to share. While I was playing Dig Dug in the week before your show, I stumbled onto an answer to a riddle of knowing how soon after the game you can still start the next game at the same level. After you lose your last life, the game will show game over for a few seconds, then it changes to a title screen with Dig Dug as a big graphic. Underneath the text, a little parade of polkas and figars who move in a single file line from the lowest part of the screen to the middle, marching in a big S curve. When the character at the head of this parade reaches the edge of the screen and disappears off to the right. Since they are moving single file, eventually all of them will exit the screen this way. At that point, the screen switches to an attract mode that shows gameplay and the scores from your last game. It turns out that if you start the next game any time during that little parade, you will start at the last level. And I was wondering that, and that that clears it up. So as long as you hit it, when the it's sometime during the parade before the attract screen you're good to go to start back at level one you have to wait until the parade is over and the screen switches from the logo to the attract mode i happen to notice this because i was trying to see how high a score i could get starting from level one and in my haste to try again i kept being reinserted in the higher game levels i've been thinking more about high scores lately spurred by your sighting of the atari age high score contest and reflecting on my own mad skills with a z in the distant past I guess we all had mad skills with a Z in the distance past. I can remember monster epic games of Defender, Space Invaders, Missile Command on the VCS when it was no problem to put away 12 or 15 levels and a great outing could go further. But I never wrote any of it down nor sent it off for any Activision patches for the games I had as a kid. I am envious of the audio submissionist, is it Soul Calibur maybe, on Ferg Show, who periodically references an ancient record of high scores put down by him and his brother in a notebook they still has to this day. I think that's really cool. On the last episode, Shinto said that he has one for Winter Games, so I wonder if what was Shinto doing that, or maybe more than, I'm sure more than one people, a person has done that. So rather than find myself still regretting not recording any of my high scores, again, five years from now, I decided to begin recording a high scores for me and the bride, and our co-op efforts. I already maintained this big spreadsheet with info about the game collection, so it was no big deal to add a few more columns and start keeping track of our scores in each game. I keep a camera handy in the living room and take snapshots of the end score screens and then save the highest ones. Already this extra element of OCD fun has added a new dimension to gameplay with both my favorites old and new and also the obscure titles. Even with many so-so scores achieved on games where my skills have gone from mad to sad, I feel like I'm laying down a baseline of mediocrity from which I will rise, rise, rise over the years to come. Wink. One more thing to say about Dig Dug. Even though I play the game frequently in an arcade, and it is really a decent game, I've always considered it to be a pale shadow of the one-screen digging glory of Universal's Mr. Do. The comparison was beautifully made by one of Ferg's listeners when discussing Frogger and Stampede by Activision. He noted that that Stampede is literally half the game of Frogger. You have the road but no river. You have only two dimensions of movement versus the four of Frogger. In my opinion, Dig Dug might be, well, a third or fourth of the game of Mr. Do. Okay, hang on just a second. When did this become the Mr. Do podcast? This is the Atari 7800 game by game podcast. Mr. Do is not an officially released game on the Atari 7800. Maybe it's a homebrew. I really don't know. But you know what? Ed, I like you. I, I'll, I'll let you go on this 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 next time. Okay, you can talk about, you can get your Mr. Do off your chest and we'll go from there. And, and before I go on, maybe part of this is just due to the fact that I'm embarrassed to say I have never played Mr. Do. I'd never seen it in the arcade, maybe once. I think I might saw it once, but I didn't have a quarter on me. It was like in a laundromat. And I think there was a 2600 version, but I never saw it. I think there was a SNES version of it, but that was at a time when people were playing, you know, Street Fighter 2, not uh, the older arcade games, even though the conversions were really good. So I've never played it. But anyways, Ed, go on. For stars, let's start with the idea that Dig Dug is a make-your-own maze game. It doesn't really hold up. The common element in all the mazes, maze games was clearing some sort of item while being chased by an enemy. Mr. Do delivers 
on this since you can dig your way to and through all the cherries by whatever route you want. Then the level is ended, but with Dig Dug you can clear away the dirt and it makes no difference. You get some points for digging, but killing all but one of the enemies is the only way to proceed. In my mind, this makes this game more of a shooter. That's an interesting way to look at it. Well, but can you drop rocks on planes and shooters? That'd be really cool. We need, you know what? We need more rocks in Galaga. With Mr. Dew, you can clear the level in advance by eating all the cherries, killing the foes, and killing the last of the letter people to spell extra, or scoring that mind-blowing free game diamond. Likewise, in Mr. Doom, you can kill enemies from near and far with the ball, or you can use apples to set traps and block passages. With Dig Dug, the enemy has to be right on your tail to get them with the pump, and the rocks can only be used the one way with timing just right. That works okay in the earlier levels, but with the pump, I find it impossible to stay ahead once they are coming after me three or four at a time. Finally, in Mr. Do, the bonus items is not just a source of points, but it temporarily freezes the regular enemies and turns loose a letter person and his henchmen, during which you can kill the regular guys or pursue the letter person or both and you get the bonus points. All kind of options in Mr. Doom that allow you to change strategy as needed, plus four little cutscenes to reward you for various accomplishments. So after all that, I know it sounds like I hate Dig Dug, but that's not true at all. It's a fine game that I enjoy, just like Stampede. Okay, that that's hitting below the belt there, Ed. As a kid, I remember Dig Dug being far more common in arcades as compared with Mr. Do, and I would usually play Dig Dug since I could make a quarter last for five or seven levels. But if Mr. Do was on a premise, it was no contest. I encourage any fans of Dig Dug to give Mr. Do a try. As far as I know, it's available to most of us via MAME or the ColecoVision port, which I am very excited to try in the near future. The 2600 port of Mr. Do is too primitive to deliver to goods in my humble opinion. So there you go. That's his uh, Mr. Do is Better Than Dig Dug, which really has nothing to do with the Atari 1700, but I like Ed, so I let him have that little time in the sun. I also got a late audio submission from Shinto. So let's see what Shinto has to say about Dig Dug and Food Fight in this edition of Shinto Says. For the longest time, the only Dig Dug that existed to me was the Atari 7800 version. It was a brilliant game. We played it a lot, uh, trying to get to the next weird color shift. It was, it was inventive and, and fun. Uh, after about a year, maybe two, I saw a Dig Dug cabinet in a pizzeria arcade. It was in the back right corner, past the Star Wars, opposite Crossbow. That pizzeria still exists and still has an arcade, last I checked, but it's notably lacking cool games like Dig Dug and Star Wars and Crossbow. But anyway, I remember the arcade machine boasting cleaner graphics than the Atari 7800 Dig Dug. Not by much, mind you, but the thing that, that really struck me were that the sounds were weird and alien. I guess when you spend so much time with one thing, any minor deviation can be jarring. I only had one quarter for Dig Dug, and it didn't last very long, not nearly as long as a 7800. So I guess uh, the skills on the console version don't directly translate to the arcade. Some years later, we found the Atari 2600 version of Dig Dug. We bought it for the sake of collecting, it was probably quite cheap, and plugged it in and out of curiosity. The graphics were dull and blocky, but I was shocked to hear the identical sounds that the Atari 7800 generated. It was at this point that I realized the 7800 had the same sound hardware as its predecessor, which was something that simply hadn't occurred to me before. When I played Dig Dug with my kids, usually the arcade version in a Namco collection, but sometimes on the 7800, I would, I would tell them that uh, we were fighting evil balloons come to life. See, that way, when you pump them full of air until they explode, it's not creepy or disturbing. They're, they're just balloons. For high scores, my brother has the top one at 78,390 points on the pineapple skill level. I don't have a date on that one for some reason. We always recorded the top two scores, so I held the secondary high score of 60,030 points on October 7th, 1988. But uh, still to this day, even after playing the arcade version of Dig Dug so much, I, I still think the Atari 7800 Dig Dug sounds are correct and the arcade sounds are all wrong. I'm giving Dig Dug a rating of solid. It's not quite Hall of Fame for me, but it's pretty darn close. Speaking of Hall of Fame, spoiler alert, let's talk about Food Fight. I've never seen or played the arcade version of this game, so as far as I'm concerned, the 7800 version is flawless. I, I did play the Flashback 1 version, but 
honestly, it's so dreadful that I turned it off in disgust after one level. I, I know that sounds elitist and snotty, but the only reason I keep my flashback one is to prevent it from falling into anyone else's hands, to, you know, give them the wrong impression about the 7800 and its games. There's an independent used video game store that I frequent, and, and sometimes I think about buying the flashback one they have there for sale, just so that nobody else does. It's really overpriced, though. Don't get me wrong, I know the story behind the Flashback 1, and I have the utmost respect for Kurt Vandell and Legacy Engineering, now Syzygy Engineering, I guess, but the Flashback 1 is absolutely no substitute for the real thing. That was a bit of a tangent, sorry about that. But getting back to Food Fight, I would point out to my friends how the title screen was a great example of graphic shading. Those were the exact words I used back then, like I knew what I was talking about. But the, the best part comes after the title screen, and from there on it's nonstop fun. My, my brother and I fell into a few basic rituals playing this game. First of all, when the level opening music played, we would spin Charlie Chuck's face around twice, because if we were lucky enough to get an instant replay, it was always funny to see him spin around a few times before getting started. If we picked up a pie, we would always try to run up to a chef and smack him in the face with it at the last possible second. Again, looks great in an instant replay. Wait for it. Wait for it. If there's a watermelon, uh, we'd park ourselves there for a while and fling it rapid fire in all directions until you nail all the chefs a couple of times each. It's like a, a watermelon machine gun. Awesome. And above all, always bring some food item with you into the next level. Even if it's just peas, it's better than nothing. Triggering an instant replay was the height of accomplishment. We would try to figure out what exactly we needed to do to sufficiently please the game so that we could see that glorious screen that says, Let's see that again. Instant replay. The high scores for this game are ridiculous, probably because we tended to play it on the beginner skill level all the time. The top score is 10,087,100, which my brother recorded on October 13th, 1991, and it was about twice the secondary high score that was recorded three years prior. Both are on the beginner skill level. There's an asterisk next to the top score, and the footnote reads, 351 levels, 52 lives remaining. I guess there comes a point when you've all but beaten the game and continuing to rack up the score is kind of pointless and boring, so you just turn the thing off. He probably shouldn't have still been playing at the beginner skill level at that point, but, but oh well. So as I mentioned, Food Fight is an easy Hall of Fame game for me. It's a, it's a blast to play, signature 7800 title, and pure arcade bliss. Hall of Fame all the way. Thank you, Shinto. That was awesome. Let's see, where do I start? First of all, I really liked all your home rules you had for uh, Food Fight. It reminds me of like Monopoly home rules a little bit. I like the twirl in the head two times just so you could get it for the instant replay. And going up all the way to level 351, I didn't even realize. Uh, did it keep track? Did it actually say 351? I don't know if you remember, but that's kind of curious. I don't think I ever went that high. I may have went up to 100 when I was uh, younger, when I originally had it. So very cool there. As far as the flashback one, maybe someday I'll get into it more because it is kind of a, a, a plug and play 7800, but it really isn't. It has some 7800 games, but for those of you who don't know, it's based on the NES on a chip technology. So it's like playing 7800 games on a Nintendo, which was not made to play 7800 games, just like a 7800 is not played to, made to is not made to play Nintendo games. It just doesn't work really well, especially the 7800 ones. You can get away with it with some of the 2600 games because of the limited capacity that they have. And, it, you know, there's less stuff to mess up in a sense as far as graphics and whatnot. But, yeah, I, I maybe someday we'll talk about the flashback one. Not too sure, though. Um, interesting about the Dig Dug 2. It sounds like you're, you're kind of like me where you grew up with the 7800 version. And interesting... You know, kind of what Ferg was saying. Ferg was used to the arcade version, so the sounds in the 7800 port drove him crazy. Where it sounds like, you know, if you grew up with the 7800 version, it was just the opposite, where the arcade port drove you drove you a little crazy. And it's cute that you tell the, them that they're balloons that you're uh, blowing up. You know, you could also go with the ghost story as well. So thanks again, Shento. But let's go on to feedback from today's games. And that is Joust and Galaga. Let's see what everyone had to say about Joust and Galaga. I asked everyone to rate the two games based on the highest one being a Hall of Fame game. That would be a top five game in your collection. The next highest rating is a solid rating. The third rating is a meh rating. That's kind of a game that's not, you know, totally terrible, but does, just doesn't do anything for you. And then the final rating, the lowest rating is a trash rating. 
Ed from Ed Laden says, I love Joust. This was the only full-size arcade coin-op machine we ever owned. So I was really happy that the 7800 port delivers the goods if you have a decent flat button to work with. I know it sounds like slobbering self-promotion, but this is one of the 7800 games most improved with an arcade controller, just like the ones he sells, in his humble opinion. Easily a Hall of Fame game for Joust on the 7800. Galaga is a great game and a good port, but not quite on top. Gonna give that a solid rating. Michael said, I would give Galaga a solid rating and Joust a Hall of Fame rating. Just like Food Fight, I think Atari did an incredible job porting Joust to the 7800, and I remember truly enjoying this version as I did the arcade. And I, I agree, they did a really good port of Joust. Greg from the SNES podcast gave both games a solid rating. Willie from the ColecoVisions podcast and Arcade USA on YouTube gave Galaga a big Hall of Fame rating, not just a regular Hall of Fame, a big Hall of Fame rating and Joust a solid rating. And Patrick gave Galaga also a Hall of Fame and Joust a solid rating. Kind of interesting. It's like it's either one or the other for a lot of people. And Matt says, I'd have to say Galaga is solid and Joust is a Hall of Fame game. This is the best home version of Joust, I think, outside of emulation, of course. Played it an awful lot as a kid. Galaga is sweet for sure. I just think Joust is a bit truer to the arcade. And I'll say this too. Sometimes, oftentimes, I actually like the home ports better than the arcade ports just because uh, I like it. A little, I like to be able to select my difficulty. And you can't do that always in the arcade versions unless you have access to like the dip switches or whatever. So sometimes I actually like the home ports a little bit better. And, and I don't think that's uh, there's anything to be ashamed of that. So that's what you guys said at facebook.com at the Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast. I got an email from Ferg from the Atari 2600 Game by Game podcast on Galaga and Joust. So let's see what Ferg has to say in today's edition of the Ferg Files. Hi, Phil. Thanks for your thoughtful response about the music in Dig Dug last week. I knew you had a 7800 when it was new, but I wasn't aware that you hadn't played too many of these games in the arcades. It makes sense that you would prefer the 7800 version, but you, of course, are entitled to be wrong. And he smiles at me. So, yeah, thanks a lot. No, uh, actually, just to give you guys an idea of the arcade, the earliest arcade games I can remember is, I do remember playing Pac-Man. But my earliest re- memories are when games like Double Dragon and Rampage were becoming really popular. And then shortly after that came the Turtles arcade game. Those are probably three of the most memorable early arcade games for me. So did I see some older arcade arcade games? Yes, I do remember playing a few games of Centipede. Uh, I don't really remember playing any games of Donkey Kong or Donkey Kong Jr. But ironically, I think I played a game of Donkey Kong 3 in a, in a laundromat. As my family traveled, they would go to places where you'd have to, you know, go to laundromats and you'd find the weirdest arcade games there. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of like my era right there. So this, you know, right after the crash happened is when I kind of got into arcade games and home games as well. Anyway, let's go on. As I get into these games, I'm increasingly happy that you decided to do the show. If I'd gotten to it, I probably would have not had much good to say about these early arcade ports. Once we get out of the 1984 era and into the latter 86-89 era, it may get better. Galaga is a special game for me. I first discovered this game at a bowling alley where I was in a league. They had 6-8 to eight arcade games and we would play between frames and also while waiting for our parents to pick us up. I played Galaga as much as I could. And I watched it quite a bit too, which is how I eventually learned to let my ship get captured. I was very disappointed when I plugged in the 7800 version. Oh, I'm sorry. I hear those slightly out of tune notes in that classic opening tune and it drives me bananas. Hey, you should play Food Fight, get it? Bananas? Never mind. I got myself killed quite a few times waiting to get beamed up, but you wouldn't know it from listening because apparently you can only play one sound at a time. It is also terribly slow. I've heard some people say this version is better than the NES version, but I disagree. I would much rather play this on the NES or any console subsequent to the 7800, so I'm giving Galaga a meh. Love the game, hate the port. Wow, some tough words from Ferg. Joust is yet again a, a childhood arcade favorite, and this one fares much better than Galaga in my opinion. The graphics are great, the sound is pretty close to the arcade version. I don't think there would be room in this version for the hands coming out of the lava, 
but there they were. My only problem is with the control. I think when you flap, you travel too high too fast, and that makes the game a bit harder for me. I found myself many times on the bottom platform waiting for a jousty to come by, only to repeatedly fly over them. I think you can get used to it though, so it's a small quibble. There is a version of Joust on the NES, but in my opinion, the 7800 curb stomps it and then sets it on fire. I don't think I can give this a Hall of Fame rating, so I will settle for salad. Thanks for the podcast, Phil. Love listening, and I'm looking forward to playing these games along with you, Ferg. Thanks, Ferg, and once again, you can check them out on the Atari 2600 Game by Game podcast, the greatest 2600 Game by Game podcast in the universe today. So yeah, um, very, very interesting there. Uh, Two kind of almost opposite opinions. You know, you got two ports and uh, one you really despise and one you really like. And so it's kind of interesting. I do think the the 7800 may have been a little better able to handle Joust. I think it's a little simpler game, if that makes sense. Um, I actually like that Galaga is easier because I'm not used to the arcade and I like being able to play for a while. If I When I play the NES version, I only last a few rounds. So I'm kind of the opposite of you there. But then again, that just might be our different upbringings. You know, if you get you know, really into Galaga, you probably want that arcade version where I just want to play Galaga and be able to have some fun. So that's where we are with that. And guess what, kids? It's a very, very special day because we get a double helping of Shinto says. Let's go and hear what Shinto has to say now about Galaga and Joust. My brother was quite proud of the fact that the Atari 7800 port of Galaga was the only home console version. All other systems had to make do with Galaxian, which was older and therefore inferior. No, if you wanted to play Galaga at home, you needed an Atari 7800. This was before the NES version came out, obviously, uh, so there was a period of time there where exclusivity could be shouted from the mountaintops. I don't know at what point I learned that your ship could be captured and recollected to give you the double the firepower, but for a long time, I played this game avoiding the blue tractor beam, laughing a bit at the alien who tried to snare me with it. Are you kidding? That's so easy to avoid, it's like you're not even trying to get me. <laughs> Stupid alien. What else can be said about Galaga? It's Galaga, or Galaga as we called it back then. Pretty sure Galaga is the correct pronunciation, though. So I'll turn to the old high score binder to help me fill out this audio submission. My brother's top score was 1,080,620 points, set on May 13th, 1989. There is a Q, a capital letter Q, next to the score here, meaning that he played until he got sick of it and quit. Again, probably should have moved up from the novice skill level to try something a bit more challenging. And I can talk since I don't have a high score for Galaga in the binder, so maybe I was playing it expert. Could be. I'm giving Galaga a solid rating. Put a lot of time into this one back in the 80s and enjoyed every minute. Even more so when I eventually found out the fighter capturing thing. Joust is just barely going to miss out on a Hall of Fame rating. It's a tough call, but but there are two games that I like better for my top five. I've already picked three top five games. Joust is great, though. Another fantastic two-player game on the 7800. My brother and I would always team up and play cooperatively. 3,000 point team bonus, 0 point gladiator bonus. Accidents would occasionally happen, of course, but it never devolved into a bloodbath or birdbath or whatever. My brother preferred to use the Atari 2600 trackball controller we had for this game. Probably made flapping easier, I think it was more arcade-like. Uh, we would try to stay at the top, flying the friendly skies, as we called it. And uh, the other term we, we had was uh, snagging an egg in mid-flight was called catching a pop fly. And it was, it was a great honor to get that. I was able to kill the pterodactyl early in my joust career. Purely by luck, I assume, because it was a rare, rare occurrence after that. So yeah, Joust gets a solid rating, as solid as you can get without being Hall of Fame. High scores? The top score is held by my brother. This has been and will be a common refrain as we go forward in my audio submissions. Uh, 168,400 points on July 1st, 1990, on the beginner skill level. So that's all I have for these two solid games. Um, I think you have a double dose of me this week, so I'm keeping this one short. Well, that, and I think I pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover, but if, if the first thing sounds more noble, then, then I'll stick with that. No, Shinto, that is totally fine, and actually, my backup plan for future episodes, if I get so bogged down, is just to introduce the games play your segments and then say good night see you next time so those are really cool submissions that you've been sending in and i never thought about using the trackball for joust that is a very interesting idea i don't know how well it would play i I, the only trackball i have i think i said before in the centipede episode was the sega sports pad which 
it's a weird name for a trackball, a sports pad, because you wouldn't think it's a trackball, but it is. And it was made for the Sega Master System, and the games that were made for it were absolutely terrible, but it's an okay trackball. And it does work on the Atari systems. Of course, with the 7800, it only works one button. Um, but yeah, that'd be interesting. I do know, this is totally a side note, I do know that one time I tried playing a trackball on the Sega Master System with Thunderblade, and I actually enjoyed it a bit using the trackball. So it's really interesting what you can do with the trackball sometimes if you got one. So if you got a trackball at home, next time you pop in a game, why don't you give it a try? See how uh, Galega plays, you know? Or see see how Joust plays with it. Either way, a lot of fun. Yep. Not sure. I think it's Galaga. I think that's a common phrase, but I like I like Galega. That's kind of fun. Galega. Okay, guys. So there is that. That is the audio submissions for this week. Okay, next episode, we'll be covering some absolute games, and that'll be Kung Fu Master and Title Match Pro Wrestling. Now, my guess is there's not going to be a lot of feedback on these, but if you have it, please send it, because these are slightly obscure titles. I know a lot of people know of Kung Fu Master, especially from the version on the NES. Probably not so many people know about it on the 7800, so I'm curious if anybody out there knows about these games, but if not, you know, I'll still share some thoughts on those games. But here's the deal is that I found out that the week that I'm supposed to release that episode, something just opened up, something really cool for me and my family to attend. So we will be uh, doing that that weekend instead of being able to release the podcast. So either I will release it early, which is probably a stretch. I don't think I'm going to have time to release it early, but if something happens, I will. But most likely it will be coming a week late. So a little bit of a spring break, if you will. Uh, apologize for that, but that's just how it goes sometimes. So if you have any submissions for that, you can go ahead and send them in. In following weeks, uh, after that episode, in episode 7, I will be doing Miss Pac-Man in Pole Position 2. In episode 8, I'll be doing Robotron 2084 and Xevious. In episode 9, I will be doing Desert Falcon and Ball Blazer. In episode 10, will be Choplifter and, uh, let's see if I can say this right this time, Karateka. I think that's how you say it. Karateka. I actually looked that up. So, or Karateka or Karateka. So that's going to be what's coming up in our future episodes. So if you have feedback for any games I've covered or any games I will cover, you can send them to Atari 7800 podcast at AOL.com. That's Atari 7800 podcast at AOL.com. If you never hear your podcast, give me another email. Or if you never hear your feedback, send me another email because chances are I just somehow missed it. I've included every feedback I've gotten so far and I would definitely appreciate more even if I've already covered the games like Centipede, Asteroids, Dig Dug, Food Fight, and of course this week's games, Galega and Jow. So if you have any interest or or also Hattrick and Winter Games, forgot about those. So if you have any interesting stories or feedback on those games, go ahead and send it in. Thank you guys for giving me a little part of your day. Don't forget you can check me out on the on YouTube as the No Swear Gamer where I just celebrated being one years old. That's right. I just turned one on YouTube. My first review, episode one, was Bubsy on the Sega Genesis and it's only gotten better since then. I've recently posted reviews uh, of such games as Dig Dug and Food Fight and put some cool Easter eggs and other stuff for other systems as well. So be sure to check out the No Swear Gamer on YouTube. I'd appreciate that. So that is episode, let's see, one, two, three, four, five of the Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast. I will be back soon, and I look forward to seeing you again. And remember, guys, games are fun, but always keep first things first. Take care, everyone, and have a good one. have been listening to the Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast. But you already knew that, didn't you? The Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast is part of the Retro Junkies Network. Blah 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 copyright 2015 blah blah blah. I really need to find a better job. I wonder if Ferg is hiring. I was totally into how he was like, I don't even know.